I want to start by telling you something that I just learned about a year or two ago. And in fact, this is the first paragraph of my book. For the last two centuries, economics has been called the dismal science. The person who coined the phrase was the British anti-capitalist author Thomas Carlyle. Now, I'd always thought that what he had in mind was Thomas Malth Robert Malthus, the population economist who said that population growth would outstrip agricultural output, thus causing mass, star mass starvation. <coughs> Wrong. Economics is a dismal science, wrote Carlyle, because the free market economists of his time, who dominated economics in the 19th century, strongly opposed slavery. Economics is dismal because economists don't like slavery. Interesting view of dismal. Well, for me, economics has always been the joyous science because it says that a good deal of freedom is necessary for prosperity, which means not only can you have freedom, but also you get prosperity as a bonus. So that's always been the draw of me for, on me for economics, of economics. There's a chapter in my book titled The Joy of Capitalism. And when I was working on my, just the final little draft of that chapter one Sunday morning about 5 a.m., the title of the book suddenly occurred to me, The Joy of Freedom. That's what the whole book is about. And I lead off that chapter with a quote from a friend of mine who died about nine years ago that some of you in the audience may know, a man named Roy Childs. And he said this, and I remember writing it down, and fortunately I wrote the date down. He said this in 1988. And this is how I led that chapter off. Ultimately, capitalism will beat socialism because capitalism is more fun. <laughs> A year later, the Berlin Wall fell. Now, I started out as, in, as an undergrad in mathematics. And I was reading a lot of economics on the side. I read Ayn Rand, and I really liked a lot of what Ayn, Ayn Rand had to say. And then my libertarian friends who were a couple years older led me to people like Milton Friedman, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, Henry Hazlitt. And I was learning a lot. But one of my calculus professors said, well, when we get, get in these arguments, and after, I, here's one, an interesting thing I noticed. And, and I'm, part of this is to say why I'm talking so much about economics tonight even though I know it's been pitched as a thing about civil liberties. And I'm going to get to those, but, but economics is really relevant here. Because what I found in almost every discussion I was ever in, in those days and since, is that when people start arguing about their principles, within one or two or at most three rounds of the discussion, it turns to practice. The big problem people had with freedom was, does it work? And I would be arguing with my, my calculus professor, this one particular person, and I would kind of back him into a corner. And he'd say, well, look, I admit you backed me into a corner, but I'm just a humble mathematician. I bet you the economists could take you on. Why don't you go over to the economics department and argue with them? <laughs> and I thought, you know, you're right. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something here. So I took economics in my last year of college, and we had a book by, that many of you might be familiar with, by a man named Paul Samuelson. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Canada, and we had the Canadian version, which was Samuelson and Anthony Scott was the Canadian author for the Canadian content part. And uh, it didn't cover any of the issues that libertarians were interested in, but it didn't really cover any of the issues that liberals were interested in. In other words, it wasn't covering the stuff everyone was arguing about. So I kind of gave up on the idea of going into economics. And then something happened in my last semester of college. Our libertarian group had a man from the University of Chicago come to our school named Harold Demsetz. And Demsetz kind of opened my eyes in two days of three talks over two days to what economics had to say. And I have a, t a chapter in the book titled Hooked on Economics. And I talk about some of the things I learned from him. One of the things was that free markets make discrimination on racial grounds costly. Free markets make it costly to discriminate against people on any grounds other than their productivity. Because if you refuse to hire people who are productive, you're going to miss out on good people. Similarly, if you're a landlord and you refuse to, hire, to rent to someone who's the wrong color, 
you're going to miss out on potentially good tenants. Now, it doesn't mean that people won't discriminate. What it means is when you discriminate, you pay a cost. And the higher the cost, the less discrimination. Whereas government regulations often make the cost of discriminating on racial grounds zero. And the example Demsets gave was that in American cities during World War II, uh, governments imposed rent controls. A rent control keeps the price below what the market price would have been. So at the lower price, people want to rent more apartments, but landlords want to rent fewer apartments. They, are, they don't have as much of an incentive to rent them out. And so you have a shortage. When you have a shortage, the cost of discriminating is effectively zero because you've got lots of people to choose from. And what he found by going through Chicago Tribune ads over the war period was as the shortage got worse, the percentage of ads in the Chicago Tribune that said th this is restricted, restricted was the code word in those days, that percentage went up. Now, there's another really great example of this in a recent movie, a movie in the 90s. It's one of my favorite movies titled Schindler's List. Who here has seen Schindler's List? Think about what happened there. Think of the first half of the movie. What Schindler did, he, he cared about one thing. He cared about making money. That's all he cared about. He had no concern for these people he, he employed. But he noticed that the German war office was charging out Jews at five units an hour, and I've forgotten the units, and, and non-Jewish Poles at seven units an hour. And he said, aha. I can make money hiring Jews. And that's what he did. Now, he didn't pay them. He paid the money to the German Reich office, which is, by the way, the way uh, Castro does it in Cuba. When, when people hire these workers at high wages, they pay the wages to Castro, who then gives a tiny pittance to the workers in Cuba. But something happened halfway through the movie. And some of the critics, and I talk about this in the book, some of the critics described it as, puzzling, contradictory. This man is strange. He started to like the people he worked with. Boy, is that strange. <laughs> he didn't have a Marxist cardboard character view of humans. Wow. And that's kind of relevant nowadays. I, I want to point out a couple of things that happened on September 11th that got a lot of press for the first couple of days and then have just kind of disappeared. Because we've heard that the heroes are firemen and policemen and medical people, and they were the hero. They were heroes, but they weren't the heroes. They were some of the heroes. There were other heroes too. I have a friend who has a friend who run, ran a small business in the World Trade Center. When the airplane hit the building, first thing he did, this owner of this business, was stood up and said, "Everyone out." He didn't say, "Hey, let's get 20 more minutes of work, and then let's get out." The point is that uh, we often hear, and again, this is kind of the propaganda about capitalism, the propaganda about markets, that employers are cruel. Employers don't care about people. And yet, if you're an employer, you know this. If you've known employers, you know this. What's one of the toughest things employer, what's one of the things employers hate most about their job? Firing people. And, and that shouldn't be surprising. And I have a chapter talking about this at greater length, about how markets breed virtue. Because see, one of the things that uh, um, the, the kind of the latest hit on capitalism is the following. It's true that markets produce the goods. It's true that capitalism works to produce the goods. By the way, that's a recent admission. <laughs> if you look at Samuelson's 1985 edition, You'll find him saying in there that the Soviet Union is going to really produce, it's producing well, it's going to grow well because socialism works by put, you know, forcing labor and diverting resources where they're most needed and so on. Was that the five-year plan ending in 1990? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's a recent admission. Now, in fact, as soon as the wall fell, I, I noticed something interesting. I noticed a lot of liberal economists saying, you know, isn't it great that capitalism works and isn't it great that socialism fell? And I'm, I, I want, there was a part of me that wanted to write an article saying, well, but remember what you were saying a few years ago? But there's another part that said, no, accept them. I mean, if, they, if they're now saying that, that's great. We've got them on our side. Let's go. But here's back to what I was saying. They were, 
people said, sure, capitalism produces the goods, but it's short on virtue. Well, I've got a chapter in there titled Market Virtues and Community, in which I lay out how actually markets do create virtue. Because one of the biggest virtues in life is accountability. And that's what markets create. You don't make it very far if you're not accountable. You, and, and a good comparison is compare FedEx and the US, US Postal Service. Compare FedEx and what do they call the overnight thing that's kind of overnight? Uh, Postal Express. When I hired a research assistant when I was working on my Fortune Encyclopedia, I gave her a couple rules the first day. And the first rule was, don't use Postal Express. She said, don't mail things overnight. And I said, no, 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 don't use Postal Express. Mail them overnight. <laughs> and the point is, why the difference? Because with Federal Express, there's someone accountable. There's someone who, in economics jargon, is called the residual claimant. There's someone who's responsible, whose assets or wealth or well-being are on the line. In the post office, if I have a problem and I work my way up my chain and I don't ever bother working my way up the chain, I get all the way to the top, William Henderson, no relation. <laughs> and he can't do anything even if he wants to.